here in verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, that is to Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So I want to stop there for a minute, right? I mean, it's kind of mind boggling. A lot of the times we see, uh, you, you see people's hearts right in their, in their questions and in what they say, obviously, certainly what they do. And here are the religious leaders of the time, right? And uh, we read that all the sinners and the tax collectors are drawing near to, to listen to Jesus, right? And we don't know. I mean, what, what is their response going to be? Are they going to, uh, you know, follow Jesus? Are they going to uh, throw stones at Jesus, right? We don't know. But, but they're, they're, they're drawing near to hear Jesus. And I love that. <laughs> I, I would think anybody would think, that should have caused great joy they were upset about they com they complained about so he spoke a, a parable to them saying what man of you having a hundred sheep if he loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which was lost until he finds it and when he has found it he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing and when he comes home he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Right, and so Jesus shares this, this story, this parable, right? A, an illustration obviously pertaining of the heart of God to humanity, but for purposes of the illustration, he shares... How, how many of you, right, speaking to these folks that are complaining uh, uh, or disgusted with the fact that Jesus hung out with sinners, the people that, that uh, in their mind weren't clean, weren't just right, you know what I mean? Uh, and he says, well, how many of you, if you have a sheep that wanders off and gets lost in the wilderness, which, we, which ultimately would be a death sentence to a sheep, right? There's a lot of predators out there. And so he says, how many of you wouldn't leave the 99 and go? And then really what I think is more the focus of the passage, the joy that is in the finding of that lost sheep. There's a lot of cool stories here, right? The, the heart of God to search after the one uh, among, among the many, right? The one that, that leaves. In fact, the, the story goes that as one way, if a sheep repeated this, right? If a sheep uh, tended to wander off continuously, right? Because really... It was, you know, a, a life and death matter ultimately to them. One way the shepherds would deal with that would be to break the leg of the sheep intentionally. You think, man, that doesn't sound very nice. Well, immediately he sets it, right? It's painful, right? It's very painful. But he would break the leg and he would set it. And then, of course, as they traveled and they went about their day, the only way for that sheep to get around would be around the shepherd's shoulders. So the shepherd would carry the wounded sheep until it healed. But then you know what would happen after the sheep healed? It would be so used to being close to the, the shepherd because it was carried on its shoulders that that sheep would stay very close, right? No, no longer wander off. And so uh, what, what a beautiful uh, picture uh, of the heart of God for, for the lost, the, the joy. I mean... I mean, it's interesting that, you know, and in this, the next parable we'll read in a minute too, the, the similarity and the, and the heart behind it. Uh, in verse six, when, when he comes back, that he, that he calls the, the friends and neighbors and they celebrate this one who has been restored, right? And you'll see in the context of the whole passage, that's really the heart of the matter here is, is the joy that is, uh, expressed and the joy that is found in heaven when someone comes to Christ. And I would suggest whether it is uh, a first time, right? Maybe, maybe someone has never bent the knee to, to follow the Lord and that person realizes, you know what? I, I, I haven't kept up with God's, you know, step. That, that was me. I mean, I was almost 25 years old, right? And I, I had, you know, grown up going to church, uh, but certainly not, you know, walked with the Lord kind of in my adult life. And I, I was listening to Pastor Raw share about Enoch, you know, a man in the Old Testament who, uh, and what caught my attention, and there's much you could share about Enoch, and there's amazing uh, uh, lessons from Enoch, but what caught my attention was a very simple statement. 
He said Enoch was a man who walked with God. He was righteous. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And I realized, man, and, and of course then I, I didn't really know. I didn't, probably, I didn't know I've ever heard of him before, really, or, or certainly not paid attention. But what caught my attention is like, man, though I, I, I believed in the existence of God, I absolutely was not following God. Right? Jesus said, come and follow me. I absolutely was not right doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord, doing a lot of things that were wrong in the eyes of the Lord. And so it was, it was that simple sort of statement that really got my attention about the importance of getting right with the Lord. And then I was thrilled when he gave an opportunity for people to commit their lives to following the Lord. Glad that it doesn't mean you're committing your life to be imperfect in our conduct, because the reality is none of us are. But, but it, it, as I grew and as I learned, God sees us as that. Right, as, as we've come to him and we've, we've accepted Christ in our Savior, he sees uh, he, he sees Christ when he looks at us. And so I, I love that, that, that heart uh, for, for people. And so, uh, and then he says, you know, the, the joy that is there in verse 6, he says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And maybe at different places in our journeys and different places in our walks, you know, I, I think it's good to, you know, certainly clearly there's an application when someone comes to Christ, right, for, for the first time. But, but kind of taking the big picture of the context of repentance and turning to the Lord, there's also application for, for us who are, are making an effort, right? We, maybe it's been for a number of months, maybe it's been for multiple years that we're, we're making an effort to follow the Lord, but we realize, you know, there's an area that I need to surrender. I would suggest God is joyful when we make that choice and when we do that, right? When we say, all right, Lord, you know, whether it's uh, something in my thinking, right? Whether it's, you know, a place my mind goes that it shouldn't go, right? And I, I, I need to, to bring that, take that thought captive, as the scripture says, and, and surrender to the Lord. Or, or maybe it's an action or an inaction, right? Something that I do that maybe I shouldn't do, and I'm, I'm aware of that. Or maybe something that I, I'm not doing that I should be doing. There's those things too, right? But, but I would suggest that when we, when we read this, and man, it's, it, it's it, it really the chapter is a heart check in, in many ways, right? And we'll see that towards the end especially. But like the, the chapter is a heart check, but, but it, it, it's easy to say, man, I'm, I'm glad I'm saved, and you know, that doesn't apply to me. Well, I would suggest it does, right? Because we all have areas that we can draw near to the Lord in, and, and we see here... Uh, the, the heart of God. I shared uh, on Friday at, at, a, at, at, at Judy's funeral, a very precious, precious saint of God, something that I, I shared here a lot, and I'll, I'll share it a lot more. One of my favorite verses, John chapter 3, verse 17, which said that, says that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. In fact, at our wedding uh, reception, uh, uh, you know, they have those things they put on the tables, and and uh, we had a scripture with some little foo-foo stuff tied to it, you know what I mean? And uh, we chose three scriptures, but the one that I remember was interesting is when I said, yeah, John 3, 17. He goes, oh, you mean John 3, 16? I go, no, I mean John 3, 17. Love John 3, 16, all right? The heart of the gospel, of course. But I, I love John 3, 17 because it, it really speaks to what so many people think, which is that God is here to condemn us or he's here to judge us or he, you know, like he takes some pleasure and sending people to hell and he's just looking for an excuse. That couldn't be, I, I, honestly, that couldn't be any further from the truth. He came to earth to pay the price for our sin. He died so that we don't have to go to hell. Uh, to, to suggest that he wants that is, is mind boggling in, in all reality, right? He wants us to be saved and he went to great lengths. He himself coming to earth, the Bible teaches, so that we could be saved, dying a painful death, so that we could be saved. And so we see uh, God's heart for people. Certainly that's kind of a heart check, I, I, for it is for me, right? But the emphasis here, and we'll see this in the next parable as well, the emphasis is really on the joy in people making decisions to come to Christ, people coming to Christ and the great rejoicing that is in heaven. Right? When you make a decision to follow Jesus, the angels are, are rejoicing in heaven. And I, and I love that here. 
And, you know, sometimes people think in terms of, well, what does it mean, you know, come and follow me? What does it mean to follow Jesus? You know, I, I don't do this and I don't do that. And, you know, we kind of have our laundry list for, in our culture of what the, the biggies are, you know. And, and I know for me it was a pretty radical transformation. I was, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a big bit of the party kind of scene and, you know, just all sorts of things that I, uh, aren't healthy, you know. And, and God changed me and he changed me pretty quickly. You know, and, it was, and, and after a while, it took me a while to, to, to <laughs> learn a little grace, to be honest with you, right? Because it was so quick, you know, that, 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 that I just, I had, I had been down that road. I had seen sort of the, the emptiness and, you know, the, the, the kind of fast times at Ridgemont High or whatever, you know what I mean? The fast times and fast living and fast cars and, and all sorts of different things, you know? And, and um, I had sort of seen, and, I, and so when I'm like, wait a minute forgiven you know I, I would I would like laugh at like man I'm I'm getting up in the morning to go to men's study on Saturday like the same time I used to come home you know what I mean and, and it's so so full of joy and, and just like purpose and meaning you know going from a, a, a sense of sort of waiting you know in fact I read a, a quote shortly after I got saved that uh, <clears throat> the majority of Americans say they spend 90% of their life waiting for something you know, and, and in a sense, I get that, you know, if, if we tend to be goal oriented and that's not, that's a good thing to have goals and to have strategy to, to meet those goals. Um, but are we enjoying the process? Are we enjoying the living? You know what I mean? Life is largely, as someone said to me one time, when relationships are good, life is good. And relation, when relationships struggle, life struggles. You know, and it really starts with our relationship with the Lord. Because our relationship with the Lord, even as we studied a little bit about last week, is foundational to our, you know, our, if you want to say our vertical relationship, our relationship with the Lord, is foundational to our horizontal relationships. The closer that we are in our relationship with the Lord, our, our, our real surrender to the Lord, where our focus is on walking in a way that is pleasing to Him, it, it makes us better in our horizontal relationship. First of all, we have his power. We have his spirit that, that shows us things. I, I, I mean, for a lot of years, I mean, honestly, even as a Christian, it takes a long time and honestly, almost a daily uh, choice to put down our, our, our desires to have ourselves be first, what makes me happy, and, and to look at what makes others happy. Other-centered living. It really starts with Christ-centered living, right? Where we, we, we do that because it's God's heart for others. And, and really, at the end of the day, it is where we find that true purpose. We find that true meaning. We find happiness. People say, I was reading something the other, yesterday, I think, you know, do what makes you happy. Do more of what makes you happy. And like, and I get that, right? There's, there's, we all like to be happy, right? Which, which is more of a kind of an emotional thing, if you think about it. Right, there's joy, which is a deep-seated just joy, right? It's, it, it can't be stolen. Happiness can be stolen by circumstances. And so, on my mind, just honestly, it kind of started going, well, that's dumb. I mean, because if you just do what makes you happy, that people sort of seem to think more of your flesh, and that's really, doesn't, ultimately, you don't end up satisfied. But, it, but it, the more I thought about it, well, actually, what really makes you happy, truly happy, is being right with the Lord. So in that sense, yeah, do, do what really makes you happy, right? But that's not like in the moment, right? Do, you know, um, I think it was uh, uh, Tozer who wrote a book called uh, Holiness, Not Happiness. Well, in a sense, choose holiness and you'll be happy, right? So yeah, in that sense, do what makes you happy, be holy. And then you'll be happy. So do that, right? Seek the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. All the things that, the, that, that so often the world, we say, oh yeah, that's what the world cares about. But honestly, it's what we care about too, right? Uh, on the surface. And so um, following the Lord is largely made up in day-to-day, minute-by-minute decisions. Now, am I doing things uh, the way that the Lord wants me to? And, and it's critical that I'm empowered with his spirit because apart from him, I, I can't, right? And so 
Um, here we see, and for good reason, the joy. And the, in, in, in the, the picture, of course, here is in the rejoicing in heaven, the joy in the heart of the Father, our Heavenly Father, when someone comes to repentance, whether that's that first time, and really in the context, that first time commitment to follow the Lord, or in an area of our life. And so verse 8 says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Right? I mean, so if you if you think of, you know, your if you think of this in terms of your wealth and you lose 10% of it, how uh, what how, how many would not search diligently for that? Would look for that, but then check out here. And when she found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So you see, the emphasis here is on the joy in the heart of the Father, right? Joy in heaven over people coming to Christ and making uh, dis the decisions consistent with that. For our first point, I, I put it this way, just kind of in thinking this through. Jesus' priority is lost people. And so, I, but I put in parentheses, lost and distracted. <laughs> so that sort of loops everybody in to a degree. You know what I'm saying? His priority it, in big picture is people. Right, but, but we see here, uh, it is in lost and distracted people turning to him. And that means you. That means me. His priority is us, right? When we apply that personally, it, it hopefully brings great joy to your heart to realize how important you are to the Lord. God loves you. He is for you. He wants what is best for you. When, when you've been in a place that maybe you shouldn't be, whether it's momentary or it's been for a period of time, and you choose to say, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. His heart is so happy. We, we read about ministering unto the Lord, right? We do that in many ways, in worship, right, in praise and sharing. But, but one way is in, is in surrendering to him. We, think about that for a minute. The creator of the universe, the one who Colossians tells us holds all things together, has existed from eternity past into eternity in the future. You, me, we can bring joy to his heart. That's kind of mind boggling, but I love that truth. And so his priority is, is lost and distracted people turning to him, surrendering to him. And we see outlined clearly here in the, 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 these parables, the joy that he has when that occurs. We can bring joy to the heart of the Father by turning either an area of our life, if we already know Him, or, or surrendering our life to Him. And the next we get into a, a parable that many of us have heard probably multiple times, uh, read it multiple times, a lot of really good applications. We're going to look at it in kind of two different, um, two different respects, right? One, in, in the first verses 11 through 24, uh, what I'm calling a look at true repentance. What does it really mean to repent? What does it really mean to, 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 to see a change of heart in a life? And then in verses 25 through 32, what I'm, what I'm calling a, a question, right? And, and this, this applies to me very much as, as well as anybody. Is our heart right? <laughs> is our heart right? We'll, we'll look at a prodigal son and we'll look at what you, not a prodigal son. And we'll look at, we'll, we'll see genuine repentance. And it's not an easy road, right? It, we can do a lot of things, uh, you know, our culture could use a, a little, some lessons from this passage on how to truly help people into a better place in life. This guy went through some very, very difficult things. God allowed him to go through very, very difficult things. But we'll see that towards the end of, of the first section, we read that he came to himself. Man, wouldn't that be awesome if all these folks out there that are, are running full speed in a sprint away from things of God in our, in our society, if they would come to themselves 
right? They would come to uh, the, the truth of what we all honestly yearn for. But then also in the second part, uh, a look at what we possess as believers in our relationship with the Lord. And, and is our heart right about that? So let's pick it up in verse 11. Then he said, so that's Jesus. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. So he's asking for his inheritance, right? And it would be uh, you know, kind of a standard practice, obviously, right? Inheritance usually comes after somebody dies. Uh, and, and the father would have the option to do that, he was totally within his rights to say no, uh, but in this case he did. So he divided his portion uh, to the young son in verse 13. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, gathered all of his new uh, found wealth from his dad. So really his dad's wealth that, that was now his. And uh, the younger son gathered it all together. He journeyed to a far country and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living so but before we get tempted to think that yeah man this applies to all those terrible sinners out there right you, you think of the prodigal son you think of you know this man who took his father's wealth and and which which he did and he went out and he lived it up on you know wine women and revelry or what, whatever you might want to say but loose living prodigal means wasteful uh, that's what prodigal means. You know, the, the term is, is wasteful living. The, so you think of this, the wasteful son. So when I think about this from a standpoint of someone like far from perfect, but I, I, I do my best to, to follow the Lord. I'm very grateful for his mercy and grace. And that when I, when, I, when I fail at that, I can come back to him. John, you know, first John 1, 9 it, right? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all righteousness, right? Because remember, God did not send his son to condemn us, but that through him the world might be saved. Really, because we already stand condemned in our sin, right? He sent his son to save us, right? And so, so uh, uh, we, we read about this, uh, we see here that this son who prodigal, when I, when I look at this from what can I learn, I ask myself, where am I wasteful? Does wasteful apply to me at all? And if we're honest, I mean, for me, the answer is yes. Is there ever time that I waste that, that I, and again, I'm not talking about being legalistic. I'm not talking about, you know, working until our fingertips bleed or whatever the case may be. But is there time, my time that God has allotted to me? You know, there's a lot of people younger than me that have passed on. I'm grateful to still be alive. Um, I realized, gosh, you know, we, we shouldn't take a day for granted, you know. And, and so am I, when I read a prodigal, which means wasteful, am I, am I wasteful of the time that the Lord has given me or the, the financial resources God has blessed me with? Am I using those for his glory? Or, or am I a prodigal? Am I wasteful in that in some respect? Or the energy? Right? And as, as I was joking with someone last night, as I get a little bit older, sometimes the energy seems to be not quite what it used to be. Part of that might be my own fault. Another part is just the natural progression of life. But am I, am I using that energy for God's glory? So I think, again, not to, not to be legalistic or beat us up, uh, but, you know, when I think of my interaction sometimes with social media, is it what it should be, you know, or is it, is it overdone? I, I think it was, I forget who it was, so I won't quote uh, the individual. But they said, uh, when we stand before the Lord, uh, uh, a loose, loose paraphrase is Facebook and Twitter will prove that our lack of prayer was not due to a lack of time. Something to that effect. You get the point, right? We waste a lot of time on things that, that at the end of the day really don't matter. And there's great uses for that. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not, I'm, I'm on Facebook and, and, and use that and. You know, we, we use social media for good as we can. But like, there, there is an element where it can become wasteful. There, there, there's a time frame. Anybody ever had that little, you know, snooze reminder or whatever pop up and you can either, you can either like close the app or hit dismiss, right? Anybody ever hit dismiss, you know? And so, 
enough said on that, right? So, so, but wasteful. I think it's good for us to evaluate again, not from a legalistic perspective or to to beat ourselves up by any means, but from from a, just a, an asking a question rather than saying, "Oh, well, I'm not a prodigal son." So, you know, well, well, is there anything that I can maybe do a little better, right? We should be looking to kind of walk closer with the Lord. And so, um, he he he. The end of verse 13. There, he he wasted the possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. So, is the famine his fault? No. The fact that is he in, that he's in want his fault? Yeah, absolutely. Right. He, number one, he could have stayed with his father, which would have been ideal, right? And, and number two, he didn't have to take all of his inheritance. So, the fact that he is in want is, is on him, but the famine isn't. But that's life. Life happens, right? Verse 15, then he went out and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. So in other words, he went and got a job, which is part of the reason that the, the, the New Testament teaches us that if someone will not work, they shouldn't eat. Because what's the goal? They're gonna go get a job, right, if they can't eat. You know, I, I mean, studying this made me curious, you know, for, for a long time, uh, the federal government was paying that extra $600 a week you know, I think some of us were talking the other day. He's it stopped in September of 21, by the way. So, but you know, people wonder why there was a labor shortage. It's like, well, they make more money not working than working. Um, so, but we see here that he came to that point and uh, he went and got a job, joined himself to this household. And in verse 16, and he would, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. So in other words, the, the slop, that he was feeding the pig started to look good. That's when you know you're, you're, I mean, if that's not rock bottom, you're pretty darn close, right? And, and further, this is a young Jewish boy, right? So you think of, he's feeding swine as his job and the slop, you know, that's starting to look good. You, you know you're, you're pretty close to rock bottom if not there. And this very important passage, the, the end result of this, Difficult, difficult time in his life. The end result, you don't see the father chasing after him. We, we studied that last week, right? Jesus d doesn't chase after, he, he shares the truth. He'll provide every opportunity, right, for us to choose what is right. But he doesn't beg us. He, he lets us make those decisions. But when he came to himself, there's almost a sense that when he asked for his inheritance and he went and wasted all of his father's, uh, the inheritance that was allotted to him. Based on that, there's almost a sense that he wasn't in his right mind. He really wasn't himself, right? And when he, when he came to his end, when the father didn't chase him down and beg him to come back, the father let him find this hard time picture, of course, of our Father in heaven. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and even to spare? And I perish with hunger, he's starving. How many of those people that work for my father have more than enough to eat, even to share with others? But I'm, I'm hungry. I will arise and go to my father, and I commend him for his willingness to do that. And they'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and earth before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he rehearses this speech. We'll see that he won't actually get the whole speech out. Right, but he re re rehearses this speech of what I would suggest is a heart of true repentance. Right, in a household at that time, of course you had sons, daughters. Right, they're, they're part of the family, right? In John, we read that a, a slave does not abide forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. All right, then, then there were slaves or bond servants, right? Who were not sons, obviously. They, they didn't gain part of the inheritance, but they, they would almost be like part of the family in a sense, in, in, in the true sense of it. They, had, they did have some rights, Right? We, we think of slavery kind of like what, what tragically occurred in, in our country and many other places for many years. But, but you know, kind of this bond servant, it was, it was a, a relationship in a sense. And they did have some rights uh, 
uh, and, and expectations in terms of, you know, longevity. And then there were hired servants. This could be terminated at a moment's notice, right? So you see that when the son says, I, his plan is to say, I'm no longer to be called your son. He's not even saying, let me be like a, a bond servant, another word for slave, right? He's saying, let me be like one of your hired servants, kind of the lowest of the totem pole, so to speak. Just let me, let me be, can I just have a job? Is what he's getting at. Because he realizes that the, the workers for his father are in a better condition than where he had been. And he arose and he came to his father. So he's, he's traveling back home, he gets there, and I, this is a, a, a very moving passage. The only place in scripture where God the Father is pictured as in a hurry, it running, if you will. The only place, right? You, you don't see, you don't really read of Jesus being in a hurry or panicked, right? He just walked in God's plan and he had peace, right? But here, the, the Father, right, he arose, to, came to his Father, but when he was still a great way off, his Father saw him and had compassion. And this, this should bless our hearts. Because in whatever capacity or to whatever extent, we find ourselves in wasteful living or at a distance from the Lord. Look at the heart of God from a distance. And of course, what father wouldn't recognize his son walking from a distance up that road? You probably looked down for multiple years, hoping and longing to see them come back. Right? Uh, when he was still a great way off in verse 20, his father saw him and had compassion and he ran and he fell on his neck and kissed him. Yeah, I mean, I get, you get choked up, right? Right, reading that, the, the heart of God. So much unlike what, what so many think today about God being judgmental or, or, or critical or out to get us, right? God's heart is to see us come back into relationship with him. Not because some benefit to God, but because of, of the harm of sin to us and the joy that is in the Lord and that we can experience in a relationship with him. And the son, so verse 21, he starts the speech, right? We just read up there in uh, verse 18. He starts the speech uh, uh, to his credit. That's why I, I, I say this is a look at true repentance, right? Genuine change. I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. All right? that was the first half we just read, right? The dad interrupts him. And he says, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. So you see the heart of God, right? We, we can often feel like whether it's, uh, you know, I, I think there's kind of a, an understanding, like when we first come to Christ, we first kind of bend the knee, so to speak. There, there's sort of a, there's a relief. Man, my sins are forgiven, right? Younger men, you, you know, you, you, your sins are forgiven, right? And, and there's just such a joy in that. But I, I think as time goes on, and maybe you've walked with the Lord five years, 15 years, 25 years, and there can kind of be a sense, man, I should know better. And that's not really wrong but we're human, right? We fall short. And so God's heart to see that repentance, right? That, that, that return, whether it's with our life or, or in an area of our life, to, to lay down where we were off and, and to come back into that relationship with him. And we see this beautiful picture of, of, of repentance and return to the Lord. David Gustick says the last son demonstrated the, uh, the repentance Jesus specifically spoke of in previous parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. After his misery, he thought completely different about his father, about his self, and about his home. Right, him, him coming to his end, the father letting him go, coming to himself, he gained a true view of God and of himself and of his home. And he was forever changed. 
first, right, first he said, Father, give me. He just wanted a handout, his whole inheritance. And he went and he absolutely wasted it. But you see a change of heart. Then he says, Father, now make me one of your servants. Make me one of your hired servants. That's repentance. That's a, that's a change of heart. That is a patient and a loving father letting, letting our Heavenly Father, letting us, right, is the picture, wander and, and um, uh, uh, find the end of our way. And come back to him, but David Grister concludes, only the second request brought true joy to the heart of the Father. First request obviously brought heartbreak. But true joy and repentance. You see, the Bible teaches that God, God does have a plan for each and every one of us, whether we know the Lord or we don't, whether we even believe in him or whether we don't. He has a plan for our lives. And, and he, his heart is for peace. A, a, a life of peace, and that doesn't necessarily mean circumstantial. I mean, that would be his heart, but, but we don't always get to experience circumstantial peace, because that can be impacted by people around us that we don't have control over their decision, right? But there, there's peace in our heart, the peace of Christ that is beyond understanding that we can have, that we can enjoy, right, regardless of the circumstances, right? He has a plan and a purpose for us, but the problem of sin, that is our sin, gets in the way. Right? Sin separates us from God. And so that would seem to be an apparent problem, right? God is righteous. He, he must punish sin because he's a righteous judge. But he's a loving father. He doesn't want to punish you and me. Right? He, he, he wants to see us have a new life and joy. Well, well how, did, how does he fulfill both? He solved that in the cross of Christ. The Bible teaches that, that, that Jesus is God himself who came down to earth. And he paid the price for our sin so that we could have the opportunity to be reconciled to him. Our response is to, to believe that, to receive Christ, you know, to, to, to believe in that application of, of his life for ours and, and to apply that to our life by faith. And in doing that, we receive, we sort of trade life for life in a very real sense. We now have the life of Christ. All that means a, a child of God. When he sees you, once you've made that choice, he, he sees Jesus, he sees perfection, he sees righteousness. Right? Because Christ has taken our sin upon him. And, and we receive that by faith. And then last but not least, right, as, as, as we see that look at true repentance, and that's really where, where it, it wraps up, um, we, we see, let's, let's pick it up in verse 25. Now this older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what these things could mean. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because of, he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. The older brother was angry. Right? So that's why I say, this is our heart right. Should he have been angry? I mean, you, you could understand you know, from a standpoint of what he's going to say, but, but really, I mean, his brother was, was dead and now he's alive to, to them, right? His heart wasn't right. And, and he would not go in, therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. Sort of interesting, right? He pleaded with them. Verse 29, And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. In other words, I've been faithful. All right, you think of the context here, right? The, the idea, really, us to... Our Heavenly Father, I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat and that I might make merry with my friends. He's jealous, at least momentarily. Not that his heart doesn't change eventually. But as soon as this son of yours, and I doesn't even call him his brother, right? As soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, no, no doubt he did, right? He went out, the prodigal living, kind of the extreme, you killed the fatted calf for him. This guy, you, you, you could, you, in his voice, you could hear a risk of becoming bitter. Right? Becoming bitter towards the situation. And he said to him, so the father says, son, you are always with me. That in and of itself is a great, great reward. <laughs> right? I mean, I, you know, not that you can't understand kind of what his sort of complaint is. 
But, but first, the Father said, you're always with me. And that's so much to be grateful for. Sometimes people talk about, you, you know, share testimonies, and you hear kind of what I call the raw Reese, you know, testimony, like the hardcore way out there in the world. And, and, uh, and, and then you have those who came to Christ at a very young age. And, and when we tend to glorify the, you know, the wife beater, you know, who comes to Christ or the real bad guy who comes to Jesus, right? I mean, I, I think that one of the, the awesome, most awesome testimony is someone who follows Christ from a young age. Right, and, and it's still a decision, it's still a daily decision like the rest of us. But there are such benefits to that, right? There's, there's such blessings to that, you know? And, and I'm grateful you never heard Pastor Chuck, who from the youngest of ages, you know, jealous over the attention that Rawl or Skip or, you know, Greg or some of those guys got. Joyful, right? But, but what, a, what a testimony. You're always with me. And no, all that I have is yours. The young son's not going to get his inheritance back. He squandered it. Right? All, everything now belongs, when the father passes, everything now belongs to the son. All that I have is yours. You're always with me. What a great blessing. And all that I have is yours. But then listen to this. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again. And he was lost and he's down. And that's why I ask, it is our heart right? He had the blessings of this relationship all along. In terms of the possessions, it's all his. The brother took all of his, right? But his heart, his heart was right. His heart was wrong. You know, the heart of the matter is that it's really a matter of the heart. Is our heart right with the Lord? It is our heart right? where God wants to be. And, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of lessons we could spend the next many weeks in this parable, right? There's a lot of amazing lessons to be taken from this, right? But, but I would suggest for us is that when, when we look at culture, and, I, and believe me, I struggle with this just that we get, it's easy to become bitter, to become angry, to be very, very frustrated with some of the absolute insanity that's going on. But Jesus is, back to our first point, Jesus' priority is lost people. His heart is for lost people. You know, we, we know that there's a lot of hurting people, a lot of afraid people, a lot of confused people. And we might disagree with the reasons that they're in that place. We might, I, I think part of being in Christ, I mean, sometimes we can see very clearly the issue, right? We either, fear, we either feed our fear or we feed our faith, right? And, and kind of what we do choose has an impact on on how how we live i would encourage us to feed our faith be in god's word trust in the lord right and enjoy the lord know that our circumstances in our nation don't dictate our joy they don't they don't change our call right as as, as i'm very open about as much as i'm you know, kind of just disgusted by, by leadership in our nation, right? U ultimately, my king is not, you know, anybody in, in an office. It's Jesus, king of kings and the Lord of lords, and I'm grateful for that. The breakdown of our nation is a breakdown of a nation turning away from the Lord and, and our heart being off. And so I would suggest for us, as, as we evaluate this passage, you know, I, I heard uh, Greg Laurie share this week, yeah, there's a storm coming. But even better here than that, Jesus is coming, amen? We, we can look to the, the joy, and, and in a very real sense, Jesus is here, right? The kingdom of God is at hand, it's within us, it's, it's around us. And so we can walk in and enjoy that. And I would, I would encourage us, though, to align our priorities with what we see here. Jesus' is priority for the lost, to the extent that we find ourselves distracted, from the truth of God's word or from making decisions consistent with that, let us get back on track. Let us not be wasteful, prodigal, right? And then evaluate our heart because God loves us. God loves you. He is for you, right? He wants what is best for you regardless. And, you know, we can all look through this and I think maybe there's an element in, of some respects uh, of each of us on both sides of this, right? So let's just bring it back. Where, where we need to be 
and enjoy the Lord. Let our priorities be for the, the least and the last and the lost. To look for uh, hurting people. Would we find ourselves in that place? Be open and honest about it. Get prayer. Get, get help, you know. <clears throat> but, but get back after the focus of, of Jesus, which is reconciling the world to himself. That, that truly is our only hope. You know, uh, some of us were at the, the Family Leader Conference this, this week and um, so encouraged by so many out there in, in, on the world stage and in, you know, the state houses uh, and, and churches on the front lines, out on the streets, making a difference for the kingdom of God. That truly is where our hope is at. And so I would encourage us, right, to evaluate as our heart, right? Certainly if we're, we're here today and, and not in a, a place where, where we realize, yeah, I've, I've made that decision to surrender my life to the Lord. I'd love to pray with you afterwards, pray for you, pray with you uh, to make that happen, right? To, to surrender, make a decision to follow the Lord today. He is our hope. And certainly if there's any areas that uh, are, are off, let's pray about that too. And I'm not the only one that can pray for you. Grab some, grab a neighbor, or trusted loved one, you know. But but let's let's make these things right and and go for all that God has for us. We don't want to be the prodigal. We don't want to be wasteful. We don't want to be the older son that's bitter and jealous, if you will. We want to be like the picture of the father here, right? Who loves people enough to let them come to their end, but points them and receives them back gladly, you know, uh, uh, when they offer that, that heart of repentance. And no doubt for many years was faithful in helping uh, him understand those things so he knew where to go back to. And, and we can do that along the way too, right? And, and point people back to where the true hope is, the true peace, the true joy, and that is in relation with the Lord. Amen? Let's stand.